Hey everybody, my name is Nathan Smith and welcome to uh, Microsoft Word part one. Um, let's see, I, whoop, there we go. Okay, <laughs> it's actually working. Um, like I said, I'm Nathan Smith. I'm the digital literacy specialist for the Central Arkansas Library System. Um, and uh, I'm glad you're here. We've got a ton of cool stuff coming up as always at CALS. Of course, uh, all of our programs right now are virtual for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, so definitely uh, head to the website and check that out. Uh, if you wanna take a look at the, um, all the events that are coming up, just head to cals.org, move your mouse over events at the top of the page and click on uh, search for an event, and that's going to show you all of the kind of ongoing and upcoming uh, events that are happening. Uh, we'd love to have you for any of those. Uh, tonight, we're doing a uh, uh, a um, one of the sessions of a series called Cooking Matters. Um, <clears throat> that's going to uh, that's been pretty cool so far. Uh, basically, about ways to uh, um, to make sure you. Uh, that you are using uh, food well, uh, not wasting food, uh, keeping things economical, um, so you can uh, so you can save money and as far as your grocery bill and things like that. Uh, so um, you can join us tonight for that. Um, and there's a lot of other cool stuff that's happening too. Uh, if you want to look specifically at technology classes, um, again, move your mouse over events on the website, click on technology classes, and uh, you can see the list by clicking on. Uh, view and register for classes on that page. So pretty straightforward. Um, this is part one. Part two of the Word course is happening on Thursday. So hopefully everybody will be able to join me again uh, Thursday, same time, same place for uh, for Word part two. So we can um, uh, so we can uh, we can get into excuse me some. Um, some more really interesting stuff uh, that Word can do. Uh, all right. Well, a um, couple of quick preliminary things to get out of the way here. Uh, pretty much always at the beginning of class, I like to um, uh, I'd like to just start by encouraging folks to ask questions throughout the session. Uh, if you have questions, just uh, feel free at any point to uh, if you're joining me here on Zoom pop them in the chat. Um, to get to the chat, if you're on your computer, what you'll wanna do is uh, go down to the bottom of the screen and look for a little speech bubble. Uh, and um, uh, and that's, uh, well, that's the chat button. It should say chat right underneath it as well. Uh, also, or if, you're, if you don't see that, uh, or if you're on a mobile device, uh, you might have to look for a more button on a mobile device in particular, you may need to tap the middle of the screen, tap more at the top, and then tap on chat, and uh, and that should get you there as well. So uh, <clears throat> so please feel free to ask questions uh, whenever they uh, whenever they occur to you. Uh, I'm not worried about being interrupted. That's not going to bother me one bit, uh, and um, I'm not worried about whether it's a dumb question. Uh, the point of the class is for folks to learn stuff. So. If you're here and you learn something useful by asking a question, um, then that's then we've we've done what we set out to do. Uh, if you're here and you don't learn much because you're afraid to ask questions, then we can just wrap it up. Uh, we don't we don't need to be here because the class is not going to serve uh, its function. So um, so please ask those questions whenever they occur to you. Um, I love it when folks ask questions because it shows that they are. Uh, that they're engaged with the material, and um, and uh, uh, and sometimes I learn something new as well. So um, always excited about that. Please just let me know. Speaking of letting me know things, the other big thing that I want to make sure that you speak up about is if there are technical difficulties, if uh, my microphone goes out and you're unable to hear me, or if you can't. Um, or uh, if during the, the main portion of the class, you stop being able to see my screen or my screen freezes up or something, uh, let me know about that because I wanna make sure that we, um, that we address those technical problems as soon as they arise so that we don't waste a bunch of time where I think I'm teaching and you're just staring at a frozen screen. 
uh, it's um, really helps to be able to um, uh, to be able to fix those problems, uh, you know, as soon as they come up. So let me know if that happens uh, in in the chat uh, on Zoom or if you're in. Um, uh, oh boy, all my little windows disappeared here. <laughs> um, or uh, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, let me know in the comments. Um, well, I guess it's the live chat on YouTube. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Um, let's go ahead and dive in. So I'm gonna fire up my screen sharing here really quick and we'll start talking about Word. Let's see, oh, of course, my Zoom window also disappeared, yay, okay. All right, there we go. Excellent. So <clears throat> I've got the um, uh, I've got the um, I've got everything pulled up, and I have opened uh, Word up. A couple of things, or one thing um, to mention at the outset: uh, if you're using Word on your computer, yours might look different from mine. Um, on my computer, I am using the uh, the Microsoft Office 365 version uh, of Word. So if you have an older version of Word, it'll probably look somewhat different. That's okay. Um, the material in this class applies to pretty much every version of Word from, I would say about Word 2010 onward. So, um, so if, you have a, if you have a reasonably new, reasonably functional version of Word, then uh, this is probably going to apply to you. You're probably going to learn uh, some useful things here. Um, so if yours looks slightly different than mine, don't despair. Uh, that's normal um, and, uh, and it's okay. Uh, it should still basically work the same way. All right, so uh, I've opened up Word and uh, what I'm seeing here is kind of this starting screen. Um, what this does is allow us to sort of um, uh, to go a few different directions in terms of, of getting things rolling. Um, we can, uh, eh, let's see, let me open a couple of windows here just so I make sure. Okay, good. All right, excellent. Um, so uh, over here on the left, we have kind of a little menu bar that gives us options like uh, creating a new document, uh, opening an existing one on our computer, uh, changing settings for our Microsoft account, uh, giving Microsoft feedback if there are problems with Word or if it's like, you know, I'd love it if Word did this, that sort of thing, um, or changing the, the settings, the options uh, for the program. Up here at the top, we've got a bunch of um, what we call templates. So you may or may not see a lot of these. You might see only one or basically none. Um, but these are basically designed to be sort of a starter document so that um, things are mostly laid out and really all you have to do is like change the text and maybe swap out an image, things like that, um, so that you don't have to start from scratch. And sometimes it's really helpful because um, it's frustrating to start from scratch sometimes. Um, and so this gives you a, a nice way to sort of add polish to your document without having to, to do a bunch of extra work. Uh, and then down here at the bottom are some recent documents uh, that I've uh, that I've had open, um, you know, not too long ago. If I want to jump into editing one of these, I can just click on its name, and uh, as long as that file is still on my computer, I'll be able to jump straight in and edit that. I can also pin documents in this pinned area so that I can get to them quickly if it's a document that I use a lot. Um, and there's shared with me, which uh, uh, which is basically um, if folks use certain Microsoft online services to, sh to share a document with you so that you can collaborate on it, you would find those there. All right, so um, all of that said, let's go ahead and just click blank document over here. Um, uh, you might have to double click it, but basically that should get you in uh, to kind of the main view here in Word. So I'll double click on that um, and that rather than starting with a template where things are kind of already filled in and I have to replace stuff. I'm, I am just gonna start with a blank slate this time uh, so, that we can, um, so that we can build it all up gradually. All right, so uh, here, uh, well, 
let's talk about kind of the layout of um, of the um, of the word window. So that way we know sort of how to get around and generally where things are. Uh, up at the very top, you've got a few things going on here. Uh, first of all, uh, I have uh, up here document one um, hyphen and then word. All that's doing is document one is kind of a placeholder temporary name for the document that I'm working on. Um, and I can, um, I can sort of, or once I've given my document a name, uh, then that will uh, and saved it on my computer, then that will show up there. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but that generally speaking will tell you what, what document you're working on while you're working in Word. Another uh, thing that I have up here is this little search bar. That is, um, uh, that's a new thing. Uh, so if you have an older version of Word, you're probably not going to see this, but it allows you to search for, um, for different pieces of functionality and uh, documentation, help documentation and that sort of thing uh, inside of Word. So that's kind of cool. Um, so, uh, but that's up there. If you've got that, then great. That's, that's kind of a handy tool to have at your disposal. Uh, over here on the other side, um, on the, you know, kind of the top left corner of our Word window is uh, an area that we call the Quick Access Toolbar. Quick Access Toolbar is basically a, an area where you can put little shortcuts to things that might, that it might be useful to have a shortcut to, honestly. Um, so over here on the left is this little switch that says auto save. And then on mine right now, it says off. Um, if you have your document saved um, in Microsoft OneDrive, uh, which is their online, uh, what we call cloud storage service, or uh, on um, Microsoft SharePoint. So if your work uses Microsoft SharePoint for uh, collaboration and things like that, uh, if you have a document that's stored on one of those Microsoft online services, um, that autosave feature allows you to just keep working and not have to um, not have to fiddle with saving your you know your document as you're working on it, and that's kind of handy. But uh, it's um, but it can be kind of annoying as well, just depending on your situation. Um, so uh, you know if you. If you don't want your document to be automatically saved, then you can turn that off, even if you have the document stored on one of those services. If you don't have the document stored online, then that autosave is not going to work. It's not going to do you any good anyway. So don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, next to that are uh, these other buttons. There are three buttons up here at the top by default. Uh, the first one is the save button right here, this little kind of disk icon. Um, if I'm working on a document and I click on that, if it's the first time that I've saved that document, what's going to happen is the document will be um, uh, the, uh, if it's the first time I've saved that document, it'll trigger what's called the save as function. Save as is basically a way for, or is basically uh, Word will give you, uh, it'll basically ask you where you want to save the document on your computer. So do you want it in the documents folder? Do you want it, you know, on your desktop or wherever the case may be? Um, essentially, how do you, where do you want to be able to find the document as you're looking through, um, uh, through your computer? Uh, and also, uh, it'll ask you to name the document. So, uh, you know, if you are working on a, um, uh, if you're working on your resume, you could call it resume uh, and then that'll be its name. And when you go to look for that on your computer, you see a document that says resume next to it, you'll know, oh, there it is. That's where my resume is. Um, if you've already changed, or you know, if you've already saved changes to the document previously, in other words, if it already has a name and a place to live on your computer, then uh, clicking that save button is just going to kind of in the background, update the existing file with whatever changes you have. So that way um, you can just click it and move on. You don't have to worry about anything additional, basically. So that can be really helpful um, to just have it, have it sort that out really quick for you. Um, and uh, you won't see anything happen on screen, or if you do, it'll be just a tiny little movement in the bottom corner of the screen. Um, but clicking that will 
will update the file. So that way, uh, so that way, whatever changes you've made since the last time you saved, uh, you'll be able to keep. Next to that are two very handy buttons. Uh, this one over here on the left, um, right next to the save button, it's an arrow that's kind of curved and pointing off to the left. That's the undo button. The undo button exists because we're all human and we all make mistakes. So when you make a mistake, uh, you can click the undo button and it will reverse whatever the last action was that you took. Let's say I deleted a paragraph of text accidentally, just, uh, you know, um, uh, for example. If that's the case, all I need to do is come up here, I'll click the undo button and that paragraph of text will come right back because that's the last thing I did was delete the paragraph. Um, if you make multiple mistakes in a row and who among us hasn't done that, then uh, you can click the undo button multiple times and it will undo multiple steps worth of mistakes. So let's say that in addition to deleting that paragraph uh, before that, I changed the color of, um, of some text and I want the color changed back. And before that, I, uh, before that, I uh, indented a paragraph and I want the paragraph to be unindented. Um, I can, uh, if that's the case, I can hit the undo button three times. The first time will bring the paragraph back that I accidentally deleted. The second time will, uh, will undo the color change. And the third time will unindent the paragraph that I indented um, when I didn't want it that way. So uh, you can undo multiple mistakes, really, really handy. Um, but sometimes we might get a little overzealous and, uh, we might click the undo button too many times. That's where the, uh, the redo button comes in. Now, um, the button that we have here is actually not the redo button. We'll talk about this button in just a second, but, um, but, but most of the time as you're, or after you've hit the undo button, you'll get the redo button It'll uh, in this space. It'll look exactly like the undo button, except it's a mirror image. It's an, it's an arrow that's pointing off to the right. The redo button, undoes your undoing. So let's say I made those three mistakes, but in my haste to correct things, I click the undo button five times. If so, no big deal. All I need to do is hit the redo button twice. If I do that, I'm back to where I needed to be. So uh, I haven't undone any work that I intended to keep, but I undid uh, all the mistakes that I made um, to get there. The only thing about the redo button is it only shows up right after you hit undo. There's no time limit or anything, but if you hit the undo button and you want to redo the next thing, or you have to redo as the next action after you hit undo. So it's kind of like a time travel movie. If I hit undo to sort of go back in time on my document, um, then, uh, um, and then I make some changes to the document and then I try to redo because, oh, I undid too many, you know, I undid too much work, uh, then I'm stuck. I can't redo at that point. You know, in a time travel movie, you go back in time, you change the past. When you return to the future, it's not like it was before. You can't return to the future that you were in before you started meddling with the timeline. Same deal here. When you go back using the undo button, um, if you want to, if you want to use repeat to sort of travel forward in time, uh, then you have to do um, you have to do that right after you hit undo. So um, that's the redo button. There's also a repeat button here if you want to do one particular action several times in a row, or even one one time in a row. Uh, say, for example, you change the color of some text. Uh, you can use the repeat button to do that same action again. If I turn some text blue, I can go find some other text and I can turn that text blue um, just by hitting the repeat button. So that can be pretty handy. Uh, the quick access toolbar also allows you to add additional um, what we call commands or tools to it. If I click on this little drop down arrow, then I can add uh, I can add more options to the quick access toolbar. And if I click on more commands then any, pretty much any option in all of Word can be added up there. So that way I can, um, if I, uh, that way I can go back, or that way if there's some, something that I find myself hunting for inside of Word a lot, 
uh, I can put it up there and that way I can get to it really easily. Okay, so that's the quick access toolbar. Now let's look down here at what's called the ribbon. The ribbon is, well, it's a design concept that Microsoft likes a lot. They use it in a lot of their software, um, including all of Microsoft Office, like Word and Excel and PowerPoint and so forth. Um, and they use it in, uh, and they even use it in just Windows itself. The idea is basically at the top of your screen here, you've got all these little tabs um, and each tab has a set of options, tools, or commands that you can that you can use in in this case for Word working on your document. Um, the way I like to think of it is kind of like a tool chest. If you've ever been to, say, a mechanics shop or a wood shop, somewhere where they use a lot of tools, excuse me, you've probably seen like a big tool chest with a bunch of drawers in it. Um, if they're pretty well organized, then probably the person uh, you know the person whose shop it is has like, you know, a drawer for the wrenches and a drawer for the screwdrivers and a drawer for the hammers and so on and so forth so that they can just go over to the tool chest, pull out the drawer, grab the tool they need, close the drawer up and get right back to work rather than having to hunt through a big pile or look in five different drawers to see, uh, you know, to see if they can find the tool that they need. So the ribbon kind of works the same way for, in this case, Word. Um, the home tab here is kind of the drawer that contains the tools we use most frequently. So, uh, so it's got things to change the way that your text looks, uh, the layout of your paragraphs, the styles uh, of your text, which we'll talk about in uh, part two on Thursday, and various other things that we find ourselves using pretty regularly as we work in, uh, in Microsoft Word. Um, Next, the home tab are, well, a bunch of other tabs here. The insert tab deals with inserting things into your document, as you might imagine. Uh, so you, when I click on that, all the tools change down here. I get a whole different set of commands and I can add a picture or a shape or a table to my document, whatever I want to, uh, to throw in there. Um, and so if you're, if you're thinking, oh, I need to put this in my document, um, then uh, the insert tab is probably what you want. The design tab deals with kind of the look and feel of your document. And so um, you, can, uh, you can change that um, by, well, by just using this. Again, we're gonna talk about this uh, quite a bit in part two on Thursday. Uh, the layout tab deals with how your, um, how your document is set up. I believe in some versions of Word, this is called the page setup tab or something like that. Um, but it's things like the margins of your page, uh, which way it's turned, the size uh, of your page and so on and so forth. We'll talk a little bit about this as we move forward. Um, the references tab deals with primarily citing your sources. And of course, if you're writing some sort of nonfiction uh, content of some sort, uh, this is uh, pretty important. You want to make sure that you're citing your sources so that you can't be accused of plagiarism. Uh, and that's what the references tab is for. The mailings tab here deals with primarily what we call mail merges. Mail merges are a way to essentially take your um, uh, take information that you have for the recipients of a document. For example, if you're sending out a letter to 100 people, um, if you have a list of their names and their addresses and all that sort of stuff, um, you can use a mail merge to basically make a personalized copy uh, for, of the letter for each person. And that's really handy. We'll talk about that in part two as well. The review tab uh, deals with collaborating with others as well as uh, checking your work through things like uh, spell check and the thesaurus and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, the view tab changes how you see your document without changing the document itself. The help tab basically just has help options to, um, to learn more about how to get around in Word and use it, uh, use it well, as well as you know, the option to contact their tech support and things like that. I also personally have an Acrobat tab because Adobe Acrobat is installed on my computer, but you won't have that and we're gonna pretend that it doesn't exist. If I click the file tab over here, 
then it's going to take me to this area called the backstage. The backstage basically gives me this blue sidebar um, with some basic options. For example, um, the option to create a new document, the option to open an existing one that's already on my computer, uh, the info option, which, which gives me information about my document as essentially as a computer file. Um, it'll tell me like how much space is there and what um, information might be included inside the document and things like that. Um, save and save as, we've talked about that they're here in addition to, of course, up at the top. Um, uh, I also have a save as Adobe PDF, which is another uh, Acrobat thing that you probably won't see. Print, so you can print it out. Share, um, which basically allows you to to send your document to folks via various online services. Export, um, this is worth mentioning for a moment here. Um, <clears throat> this export option, again, you won't have create Adobe PDF here, but you will have create PDF slash XPS document. Um, when you click on that, or it'll probably already be selected when you click export, uh, then you'll have this button that says create PDF slash XPS. This is worth mentioning because um, if you are doing something like say creating a resume so uh, that you're gonna be sending to someone, um, usually rather than sending them the Word document directly, you're gonna wanna send them a PDF version of the document. Uh, for one thing, not everybody has Word on their computer. Um, and, so, uh, and so if you send them a Word file, they may or may not be able to open it. Um, for another thing, uh, PDF documents are designed to, um, to, to be difficult to change. So that way uh, people can't make, you know, can't accidentally delete stuff from, you know, from your document or, um, you know, make significant changes without expensive software or a lot of effort or both. Um, and it's made to look the same on almost any device with a screen. So if you've got, um, so uh, it'll look, uh, you know, once you create your document inside of Word, if you create a PDF version of it, the PDF version will look pretty much exactly the same as it did on your computer, regardless of whether the other person's opening it on their phone, their tablet, their computer, whether it's Apple or, uh, you know, or uh, Windows. Um, just anything with a screen almost can read a PDF file. So um, I definitely encourage you if you're going to be doing things like resumes, um, create a PDF version of it. it. You won't be able to make changes to it very easily once you've made a PDF. Just keep the original Word document and if you need to update it at any point, update the Word file and then create a new PDF version that's updated. Um, Transform, I, interesting, okay. This is not one that I'm familiar with. So transform to web page. that's interesting. Definitely way off track for what we're doing today. Um, <clears throat> uh, don't click it, but there's a close down here at the bottom uh, that will allow you to close your document without closing Word altogether. All right, so um, the rest of this stuff we've talked about already. Um, and uh, I'd like to go ahead and dive into um, more of the, the meat and potatoes of the thing. So to get out of the backstage without making any changes or selections, just click this left arrow up here at the top, and that'll take us back. I'm gonna click the Home tab to go ahead and get these options back. And now um, we'll dive in and uh, continue on here. Okay, so underneath the ribbon, uh, we have kind of the main editing, um, kind of the main editing area of, uh, of Microsoft Word. We've got our page here. And uh, normally when you, when you get in there, uh, you'll see this little blinking line that's called the cursor. Um, and the cursor basically just says, when you type, this is where the text will show up. So uh, that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, once I start typing, text will show up there. Um, and this is designed to represent the type of page that I'm using in my document. So in this case, it's a um, kind of a standard US letter page, eight and a half by 11 inches. Um, 
And uh, so if I'm ready to put some text in, I can just start typing. Okay, cool. So I've written a little bit of nonsense here. Uh, a couple of things to point out right off the top. First of all, um, as I uh, as I typed, if you know, if you uh, if you're brand new to some of this sort of thing, that's totally cool. Uh, as I typed, I just want to point out when I get to the end of a line or toward the end of a line, uh, I'm just going to keep typing. So I'm not uh, in order to start a new line. I don't have to do anything manually. Uh, like press enter or anything like that in order to, um, to, to, to skip down to the beginning of the next line. All I have to do is keep typing and Word will automatically wrap my text around to, uh, to the next line. Uh, if I want to start a new paragraph, though, I'll press enter on my keyboard and, uh, and that'll take me down um, and actually start a new, a new line and a new paragraph manually. Like so. All right. So uh, now we've got some text to play around with. Let's talk about our options for how this text looks. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to come up here. We're going to look at this font area. Now, if you don't see these particular tools, um, then you may have to click the home tab up at the top uh, in order to get back to them. If you clicked one of the other tabs to look at the options we have there, um, the home tab is where we wanna be for, uh, for this portion. I'm trying to stay hydrated, y'all. Um, okay, so uh, what we've got first here uh, in the top left of this font section of the home tab is the font itself. Um, Another word for font is, that you might see is typeface. The idea behind this is basically um, the, the letters and numbers as you type them look a specific way. They're designed a specific way. Um, and, uh, you know, and you may wanna change, change the look of that because it might make the text more or less readable. Uh, and it also might, um, uh, you know, and you, you also may want to change sort of the just the style of the the text that you have there. So, uh, for example, I'll go ahead and highlight this first uh, this first sentence right here. What I'm going to do is move my mouse over here, hold down with the mouse button, and as I hold down, I'm going to drag the mouse over that paragraph. When I get to the or excuse me, the sentence. When I get to the end of the sentence, I'm going to let go of the mouse button, and now I have this selected is what we say. So it's kind of highlighted with the mouse. Um, now that it's selected, I can make changes to it and um, uh, that, that will affect specifically the text that I have selected and nothing else. So uh, I've, got that, I've got it selected. If I go up here where it says Calibri and then body in parentheses here, I can click this drop down arrow, the little arrow right here. And you'll notice it just says Calibri now. If I look down here, it says Calibri and then body in parentheses. Uh, in the next session in uh, Word Part 2, we'll talk about why that is. Um, but for now, just know that body is not part of the name of the font. The font uh, that we're using is just called Calibri. If I go down here a little further, move my mouse over different fonts, you'll notice that um, that the text actually changes temporarily in the middle of the document here. If I change to 
Ariel Black, for example, you'll notice when you look at that sentence that says it was a dark and stormy night, it looks different. Um, I can go down, I can find whatever font I want. Bauhaus 93, it's kind of a very like swoopy kind of um, uh, retro future kind of font. Belligerent Madness looks like kind of a scribbled sort of font. Um, you may or may not have all these fonts on your computer. So if you if there's one that I have that you don't, don't worry about it. It's, uh, you know, um, I've added fonts occasionally uh, for, for, various, for various purposes as I've needed to. Um, and, uh, and it's not going to, we're not, we're not gonna rely on you having a specific font on your computer in order to be able to, to follow along. Okay, so I'm gonna find a font that I wanna use. Um, here we go, okay, I've picked one. All right, so this one's called Harlow Solid Italic. Now, actually, let's try something a little bit more normal. Okay, I'm gonna go with just Arial. Arial is a slightly different font. Um, oh, let's go classic. Let's go Times New Roman. So I'm gonna, um, rather than scrolling down to the T section, since all of this is listed alphabetically, I'm gonna click here instead, and I'm just gonna type in as I type time, we've got Times New Roman. Times New Roman was the, um, the starting font in, um, in Microsoft Word back in the day, a long time ago when I first started using it in the 90s. Um, so, blast from the past here. Um, next to that is the font size. So the font size is gonna be um, pretty much exactly what you would expect. It's the size of the letters, numbers, and symbols as you type them. So the default is 11. Uh, if I click on this drop-down menu though, I could select a different size from the list. Or if I wanna go with say 23, which is not one of the options in the menu, I can click here, type in 23 and press enter, and that'll make it exactly that size. Great. Um, you can also adjust the font size with these two buttons next to it. There's a large A with an up arrow, which as you might imagine, makes your text a little larger. Uh, and then there's a, an, a smaller A with a down arrow, which of course makes your text a little smaller. Um, couple things to mention about this. Um, depending on where your document is going, uh, you, uh, you may wanna tweak these options. Um, if you look at these two fonts side by side, Calibri, the default font that we started with, and Times New Roman, uh, you'll notice there's a, there's a specific kind of difference here. If you look at, say, the bottom of the N uh, here um, in night versus the bottom of the N here in noon, uh, you'll notice the N in night here has this little swoosh before the N starts. You know, if you were writing the N with a pen or a pencil, you would go boop, boop, like that. Um, it has this little kind of swoosh at the top and then these two kind of flat sections at the bottom. You'll notice that in noon, the N is just strictly a stick. It's almost exactly how you would write it uh, with a, a pen or a pencil. It's just mm -hmm. a line and then kind of the hump of the N. Um, so the difference between these two is Times New Roman is what we call a serifed font. Those little flat extra um, kind of embellishments are called serifs. And uh, Calibri is a sans serif font uh, is what we call it. So it's a font without serifs. Um, serifed fonts tend to read better on paper. So if you're printing something out on paper, uh, you may wanna use a serifed font uh, to make it extra readable. Um, whereas if you're expecting your document to be mostly read digitally on somebody's computer uh, or on their phone or whatever, uh, sans serif fonts are actually easier to read on a screen. So uh, that's, that's a thing that uh, I find helpful sometimes uh, when I think about where my document is going, I can choose an appropriate font more easily. Um, the other, or uh, another thing to mention is, uh, is the size. Kind of the standard size for, uh, for business text is 11 point. So if you're writing a business letter, uh, 11, 11 is the, the appropriate font size to use. You don't want it to be much larger or much smaller than that unless, uh, excuse me, unless uh, 
there's some specific purpose behind that. Um, one last thing to mention is just uh, is just using multiple fonts. When you use multiple fonts, um, a lot of times that can be really helpful. So uh, if you um, so it can kind of it can kind of orient you. It can help you figure out where you are in the document, particularly if you have things like headings and subheadings and stuff like that. You might want to make those in a title. You might want to make those uh, a different font and probably a different size from the from the body text in the rest of your document. Um, but you don't want to go crazy with a bunch of different fonts. If you um, in almost all circumstances, if you use more than two or three fonts, uh, it's going to look a little cluttered and unprofessional to most folks. Um, so just be mindful of that. Uh, use fonts wisely, and um, and that'll get you uh, get you a long way. Okay, so enough of that. Um, <clears throat> we've got our. Uh, <clears throat> Let's talk some more about this, this font section over here. So this button with the two A's, a capital A and a lowercase a, if I click on that, I can change the capitalization of the text that I've highlighted. So I can switch to sentence case, which is basically what it is now. It capitalizes the first letter of, uh, of each sentence. Uh, lowercase, which of course will make my text all lowercase, even at the beginning of a sentence. Uppercase, which of course makes it all caps. By the way, don't write in all caps unless you mean to indicate, well, unless it's a heading or something like that, or you mean to indicate that you're shouting. Uh, in the digital world, typing in all caps is shouting. So even if you, uh, if you type a nice friendly greeting to me like, good morning, Nathan, if you type it in all caps, you're really saying, good morning, Nathan, and that's not great. So, um, so be mindful of that. There's also capitalize each word, which you might want for titles and things like that. And of course there's toggle case, which will make everything that's currently capital lowercase, and it'll make everything that's currently lowercase capital. Um, a helpful hint about capitalization, uh, the best way to capitalize your, um, the best way to capitalize any text that needs to be capitalized is holding shift while pressing the letter that you wanna capitalize. Um, a lot of keyboards have the caps lock button over on the left uh, above shift and below tab. Um, my advice about the caps lock button in general is pretend it doesn't exist and don't use it because uh, the caps lock button is more work for you in the long run. Uh, you have to, if you want to capitalize one letter, you've got to hit caps lock, then hit the letter key, then hit caps lock again to turn it off. Um, and, uh, and also it's very easy when you turn caps lock on to forget that it's on uh, and uh, and leave it on. So um, just pretend that caps lock key doesn't exist and uh, you'll be better off. Okay, let's see. So um, <clears throat> next, to, next to that is the clear all formatting button, which we'll come back to. Underneath that are some, uh, are some formats here. Uh, when we say formatting, by the way, in computer world, all we mean is changing essentially the look or the layout of something without changing the content of it. So while I've changed the size and the font of this sentence, it was a dark and stormy night, it still says it was a dark and stormy night. The content is exactly the same, but the look of it is a little bit different. Um, so other types of formatting we can do, if I click on this B, that'll make the, the text that I have selected bold. Click on it again. It will unbold it. I have italics, so I click that, it'll go italic, and if I click it again, it will unitalicize. Uh, I have underlining. If I click the U with the underline underneath it, it'll underline the selected text. Click it again, it'll remove the underlining. If I click the drop down arrow next to that U, what it's going to do is give me other underlining options. So the default, of course, is just a single black, straight black line underneath the text but I could go with a double underline, a kind of a thicker um, uh, underline. I could, go, I could go dotted lines in various ways, uh, or I could even do like a little squiggle if I want to. Um, there's even more options here under more underlines and you can change the color if you want to. Um, so you have a lot of options. Whatever you choose though, let's say that I go with a dotted line. When I click on that, 
that's going to become sort of the default. So if I go over here and I select some other text, click on it again, it's going to underline using that same style. Um, so that way you don't have to worry about, uh, about thinking, well, which underline did I use? Uh, you can just, it'll just use whichever one you chose, uh, whichever one you chose last. So I'll click that, put it back to normal, and I'll click the button to turn it off. Um, and let's leave it. Okay, so next to that, we also have um, strike through. Strike through is basically if you want some text in your document that's crossed out, just use the strike through option. Uh, next to that, we have subscript and superscript. So um, most of the time, subscript and superscript are used for things like math and chemistry, for logarithms and exponents and uh, stuff like that. Um, Y'all probably won't be doing that, so we don't have to worry about it so much. The main way that we use superscript, Word actually will do automatically. So I'll show you um, if I write something like January 12th and hit the space bar, Word is going to automatically turn that TH into superscript, as we see here. Um, and that adds a nice little, just a nice little bit of, of uh, it's just kind of a stylistic nicety. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it makes it look a little fancier without us having to really do anything. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you might use superscript for. Subscript, I can't think off the top of my head what you would use subscript for aside from things like math and chemistry, but um, you might. So let me know, uh, shout out if, you, if you've thought of a use outside of those. Um, if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted to make this just a regular TH, I could click this button again to, to take it um, to undo the superscript. If it does something like this automatically though, you can also tell it, oh, I didn't actually want that. And the way you do that is just by using undo. So if I click the undo button, it will set it back to be January 12 TH, like, it, like I typed it initially. I'll go ahead and redo it. Um, so that's subscript and superscript. We also have things like, This, uh, these, um, what do you call this thing? I forget. The text effects and typography button. Uh, so if I click on that, I can get various like more sort of detailed, um, interesting looks for my text. So this one has like, uh, this one's kind of gold. It has an outline and it has a, uh, what we call a gradient uh, inside the text where it actually sort of fades from one color to another, kind of a lighter gold to a darker gold sort of thing. Um, and you can change all of these, all the pieces of this manually if you want to as well. So you can add an outline to your text, a shadow, um, a reflection underneath it, a glow of various colors behind it. Excuse me. Um, you can change the way that numbers appear uh, as you type. Ligatures, which are like little places where uh, letters can connect to each other, uh, kind of like you see here where there's an F and an I that are sort of connected right together um, like this. Uh, and then stylistic sets, which are, uh, you can't really tell within this, but certain fonts will have, if you have, if you have certain characters next to each other, they'll, they'll make them look fancy in, a, in various ways, essentially. Um, so you can add one of these. Um, eh, we won't fool with that right now. Uh, there's also highlighting, whoops. Uh, if you click on the highlight button like I just did, then the text you have selected will be highlighted in yellow. Um, if you click on the drop down arrow next to it, you can choose a different highlighting color. And, um, and now that I've got high, you'll notice it's the button is kind of filled in in gray and it's got the little purple swatch, which tells me the color I'm using. If I go down here and I drag over and select text while the highlighting option is on, then rather than selecting the text, it's going to highlight it with the color that I chose. Um, and then if I drag over it again, it'll remove the highlighting for me. Um, click it again, you'll notice the little highlighting pin that was next to my mouse pointer goes away. And now I can select things 
normally. Um, so uh, highlighting, highlighting can kind of be, um, uh, can be useful if you want to kind of point out certain, um, certain pieces of your document, uh, just like regular, regular highlighting on paper, basically. Um, <clears throat> get out of highlight mode here. And finally, uh, we have the font color here. If I select this text, and I change it to, or, and I click the A with a little red swatch underneath it, it's just gonna change my text to red straight away. Uh, if, however, I select this and I go up and click the drop down arrow next to the A, then I can choose from a variety of colors that I might be interested in, say a blue, for example, that's nice. I'll click on that one. And, uh, and now my text is blue, great. Um, and you'll notice again, kind of like with the highlighting color and like with the underline, once I select an option from the drop down menu here, that becomes the new default. So that becomes the thing that'll happen when I just click the button. So if I want another piece of text to be that same blue, I just select it, click the A with the blue swatch, and now that text is blue as well. I'll go ahead and undo that though. Uh, no, I don't, I didn't want that part to be undone. There we go. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I said we'd or we skipped over it, but now I do want to focus for a moment here on this clear all formatting button for all types of formatting that I just showed you. So the font, the font size, bold, italics, underlining, strike through, um, text colors, shadows, outlines, whatever, all of that stuff. Uh, it's it's definitely possible to go a little crazy with it and make it. Um, and uh, make things look a little weird. So um, if you're like, oh, okay, I've done too much, like this, this is unreadable, um, then you can essentially set it back to, set it back to the default, to the way that it was. All you need to do to make that happen is move your mouse over this A with the eraser next to it, click on that. That's the clear all formatting button. And you'll notice it goes back to Calibri, the default body font of my text or uh, in my document, 11 point size, um, and then bold italics underlining, um, you know, the color, all of that stuff goes back to, uh, goes back to just plain, essentially. Um, so that can be really useful if you get a little, a little lost in the weeds uh, as far as making stylistic changes to your text. Just select the text you want to, uh, you want to put back to normal uh, and click on that clear all formatting button. Cool. Um, one other thing about all of that stuff before we move on with or from it is um, so right now uh, I've just got my cursor here. I'm about ready to type something. And you'll notice all of these, you know, all, all those settings are sort of back. If I type this is in standard style. If I if I wanted something that looked a little bit different then I can change all these settings before I type the text in the first place. So let's say I want a different font. We'll go with this one. And I want it to be bold. And I want it to be um, green and underlined. OK, I've made all of those changes. Now when I start typing, it looks different. All of those changes that I made as long as I didn't have any text selected, all of those changes that I made basically apply to the document from this point forward. And then, um, you know, if I want things to go back to the way they were, then I can just I can just change the settings back. Uh, and be good to go. I hit the drop down and go automatic there. Beautiful. Okay. So um, that's, those are your font formatting options. There's a ton of that stuff, um, but that's, that's stuff that's really important to know right off the bat so that, uh, so that you can make your document look the way you want it to look. Let's talk about these paragraph options for a minute. Now, one of the things to bear in mind about Word is how Word defines a paragraph. In English class, of course, we learned that a paragraph was, um, generally speaking, two or more sentences 
that elaborate on a specific idea or set of ideas. And if you're moving on to sort of a new idea, then you start a new paragraph. Um, that's still true, of course. Uh, but for words purposes, it doesn't get into the grammar of it all so much. Uh, what it mainly does is say, did you press enter or did you not? So um, even though this is only one sentence and it's not even a sentence because I actually didn't put punctuation at the end of it, uh, Word considers this to be a paragraph because I pressed enter before I started typing it. If I hit enter again, that's another paragraph and so on and so forth. Um, so that's how Word defines paragraphs. Uh, and when you work, or, so when we work with these paragraph options, we are changing the options specifically for the paragraph that we're that we're working in, unless we decide to, unless we go in and change, uh, or unless we select multiple paragraphs. So if I make changes up here right now, then it's going to affect all of these paragraphs and pretty much my whole document going forward until I make changes again. Um, right now, though, I have my cursor in this first paragraph. And if I make changes to this, these settings now, then this paragraph is the only one that will be affected. So just be aware of that. Okay, so the first thing to talk about in this paragraph section of the home tab here is alignment. Uh, by default, Word will align your text along the left-hand margin of your page, align left, like you see here. Um, and so you'll notice that that button is filled in with gray um, because that's the, that's the alignment of this paragraph, align left. So what it does is you start out on the left uh, side of your, you know, on the left-hand margin, you type, you type, you type until you get to the end of the line. And then when there's not enough room at the end of the line for the word that you're typing, then it moves that word down to the next line and then you start typing again. Um, uh, when you get to the end of the paragraph, you press enter, and then you start all over um, with a little gap in between, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so that's uh, a line left. That's the default in Word. You can also center a paragraph of text. So if I click that, then this whole paragraph gets aligned uh, to the middle of my document instead, and that can be quite handy. Um, you've also got a line right. Uh, if I click on that, excuse me, rather than my cursor starting on the left-hand side and moving uh, moving rightward, instead it's going to start on the right-hand side. And my text is sort of going to like stream out from behind it. So if I start a new paragraph that's aligned to the right, then it works just like that. And your cursor basically stays here until you fill up that whole line and then it'll move on down to the next uh, to the next line. There's one other option here. If I click on justify, what that's gonna do is it looks like it's aligned to the left, kind of like we had it before. But instead of, um, instead of my text being, uh, or, Instead of we get to the end and then there's no more room for the next word and so we start on the next uh, so we start on the next line. Instead, what justified text is is it's actually aligned along both margins, left and right. What happens is when you fill up a particular line of text, Word will automatically adjust the spacing between words so that your text uh, so that the right-hand side of your text is along, aligned along the right margin, and the left-hand side of your text is aligned along the left margin. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty, um, pretty straightforward. Um, that will, once you, uh, once you get to the end, or, and so the only exception to that is that uh, Word will not align the last line of a paragraph to the right-hand margin. And that gives you a visual signal that this paragraph is done because there's space here between the end of this line and, um, and the right-hand margin. Um, and that way it just doesn't look weird and unreadable. Like if you had a, if you had huge gaps in between these words in order to align this with the right-hand margin, 
uh, it'd be really hard to read. So uh, justified text is used in a lot of professional publications, in most magazines and newspapers and books. Uh, the text is justified. Um, and now that I've said that, you'll probably notice it when you open a book uh, in the future. Um, and that kind of gives us, honestly, like because we're so used to that in professional publications, that kind of gives our brain a signal that this is something pretty professional um, when, uh, when justified text is used. So just bear that in mind. Uh, it can be really handy uh, to, uh, to, to know that, that little trick of the trade, I guess. One other thing about alignment um, that, uh, that's worth speaking to is the beginning of paragraphs. So back when I was learning, uh, when I was in, in uh, elementary school and learning how to write in paragraphs, um, they would tell us that the beginning of a paragraph, you should indent a little bit on the first line. Uh, and that's a signal like, this is the beginning of a paragraph. Uh, now that writing things, uh, you know, now that writing things uh, on a computer is kind of the way that most folks do it most of the time, we don't do that anymore. Uh, instead, uh, you your text, you know, even the first line of your paragraph is aligned with the left-hand margin. Um, and then uh, paragraphs are separated by uh, that signal at the end of in justified text, um, uh, those are the um, those are the uh, you know this this little gap essentially at the end of the paragraph, uh, and then the other signal is this extra space right here, which we'll talk about in just a moment. I got a question from someone. Uh, what are the options justify, low, medium, and high for? Um, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think I've seen that. Uh, where where are you finding that? I can imagine what it might be, but um, but how do you how do you get to those options? Okay, let's see. Uh, Huh, I don't have that. That's interesting. Um, they say it's under the icon for justifying text. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, huh, that's interesting. This would be my guess, uh, I mean, Try it out. Let me know. Um, and but my guess, as far as that goes, would be um, that uh, that it probably um, that if it's essentially if it's on low, I would guess that it would um, that it would try to keep the spaces between words pretty small. Um, whereas if it's on high, it'll be more likely to kind of um, it'll be likely to space the, the text out a little bit wider. But yeah, try it out and let me know um, what it does. Because uh, if someone has that question in the future, I, I definitely wanna, um, wanna know about that. That's interesting. Um, so next to, that was a great question, by the way. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm really curious where that would show up, but... Uh, Y'all probably don't want to watch me Google, so um, so we'll move on from that for now. Um, okay, cool. So uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, one of the one of the signals that we have um, for um, in Word for figuring out where one paragraph ends and the next one begins is a little bit of space right here. In fact, while this paragraph is selected, you'll notice that uh, there's a little gray uh, kind of empty area down here at the bottom. When I click on this button right next to this, the spacing options button, you'll notice I get, uh, I get several options, um, uh, one of which is directly related to that. So down at the very bottom is this option called remove space after paragraph. When I click on that, um, what it's going to do is 
close that gap right there. So now I don't have that visual separation between the two paragraphs, which is there by default when you open a new Word document. Um, if I click add space after paragraph, it'll add it right back there. Um, there's also add space before paragraph. Um, so by default, Word doesn't put any additional space before a paragraph. Um, and so, uh, but I could add that if I wanted to. Um, so like if I add it, if I add space before a paragraph on in this one, then it'll it'll create an extra gap at the top in addition to a gap at the bottom of this one. Uh, let's see. So, um, so that's your in between kind of spacing. You also have uh, line spacing for individual lines. By default, um, the line spacing in Word is one point fifteen. So basically, you have. 15 hundredths of a line's worth of space between each line of text. So, uh, you know, there's a little gap here, even at the bottom of a Y and the top of, well, a capital letter, um, you have a little bit of space here. That's that 15 hundredths of a, of a space there. Um, if I change this, the line spacing to 1.0 or, or um, you know, proper single space, I guess you might say, you'll notice it closes that gap a little bit. Um, there's still a little bit of headroom and foot room there, but, um, but this is technically single spaced text. Uh, I could change it to 1.5, which will give me half a line's worth of space between each line of text. Um, there's double space, good old double space. Um, there's double and a half and there's triple space for uh, for two lines, essentially two lines worth of, of uh, open area between each line of text. So depending on how you want your document to look and so on and so forth, uh, you can choose one of those line spacing options. Um, let's see. So there are a couple of options here that I find pretty useless, if I'm honest with you. One of those is uh, shading, which will add a little bit of color behind a paragraph of text. Um, and the other one is borders, which will add literally a, a box or at least part of a box uh, around a paragraph of text. Um, if you're gonna do that, my advice would be to use a text box instead, which is a little bit different, a, a bit more flexible. Um, but uh, you know, in some rare cases, you might, you, might find those, uh, you might find those options useful. Let's talk about, okay, I'm gonna come down here to the bottom. Let's talk about uh, lists. So above my alignment options, let me go ahead and align this back on the left here. Uh, above my alignment options, you'll notice some listing options here. Uh, the first one is bullets. If I click on the bullets button, then it's going to indent a little bit for me and it's gonna create a little bullet point right there. Um, so let's say I'm trying to list out, um, trying to make a list of, uh, I don't know, breakfast foods. So I'll say um, cereal, eggs, bacon, sausage, whoops, help if I could spell, fruit, toast. Okay, there we go. We got some breakfast foods. Um, when I type or, you know, it creates that bullet point, it puts my cursor next to it. I type out an item and then I press enter. As soon as I press enter, it goes down here, indents again and creates another bullet point for me. Uh, and I type the next item, hit enter again, type the next item, hit enter again, type the next item. And it keeps it set up in a nice big or in a nice kind of, um, visually distinct list. Otherwise, if I'm trying to type well, I'll show you how to get out of this listing mode. If I press enter again, and then I press enter one more time without typing anything, then it's gonna take me out of listing mode and kind of back to, you know, back to kind of a normal paragraph. Um, so, uh, so this allows me to separate it visually. If I were to type out a, you know, if I were to try to type a list without using the the bullets option here, then what will happen is we'll get like, you know, um, some lunch foods. Okay, 
is something like this, which just looks like an unfinished paragraph, basically, rather than an actual proper list. So, um, so using the bullets button up here allows me to create a list, um, you know, allows me to create a list that actually looks like a list of stuff and is visually distinct from the rest of my text in my document. If I, um, if I wanna change the look of it, I can come over here while I'm working inside the list, I can come up here, click on this drop down arrow next to the bullets button and I can choose a different bullet style. For example, uh, these little hollow ones, squares, whatever this thing is, excuse me, uh, a check mark, whatever the case may be, whatever looks cool to me, click on it, it'll change all the bullets, excuse me, to be that single style. If I want to create a, a more ordered list, like for example, If I wanted to make this, since breakfast comes first, lunch comes second, and dinner comes third, um, if I wanted to make this an ordered list, uh, for instance, with numbering, I'll come up here and click on the, hey, numbering button right next to the bullets button. Click on that. Again, it indents for me. It closes those gaps between the, uh, the individual lines, and, um, and, it bullet, or, and it numbers. And if I want to add, you know, like, midnight snack, then uh, I just need to press enter at the end of, uh, of a particular option and uh, throw it in there. If I wanna add brunch in the middle here, I'll go to the end of the breakfast line, hit enter, and you'll notice it shifts all the numbering. So now I have a blank number two, and then I have three, four, and five. There we go. Um, so that's a really nice way to uh, to create, you know, to do some sort of listing uh, and make uh, and uh, and make it look visually different from the rest of your text uh, without too much hassle. If I want, I could also turn this into um, into what's called a multi-level list. Uh, the most, you know, kind of the most common version of that is an outline. If I come up here to the top and click on the multi-level list button. That button just gives me the drop-down menu regardless. There's no sort of default, um, uh, but I can choose any of these numbering options. So I've got one and then A and then lowercase Roman numeral one and then one A lowercase Roman numeral one, et cetera. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other types of, of multi-level lists I can have, including like, you know, things like articles and sections and things like that. Um, you know, uh, your kind of numbering and sub numbering with, with uh, decimals and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. I'll just go with current. And then uh, when I press enter, if I wanna add some breakfast foods underneath breakfast in the outline, I'll just press tab on the left-hand side of my keyboard. And then A, cereal, B, eggs. C, bacon, D, sausage. And then let's say I wanna add fruit, but I wanna specify. So I'll say, so I'll hit tab again, and that will indent further and give me lowercase Roman numeral one. So I'll say orange, apple, banana. When I press enter again, it gives me number four, but I don't want to do number four. I want to go back to listing breakfast foods. So I'll hold shift while pressing tab. And that's going to take me up a level back to A, B, C, D, E, F. Then I can go toast. Um, and then if I, wanted to, uh, if I wanted to go back another level, I hold shift and hit tab again. And that'll change my numbering, but I really don't want that actually. So I'll hit tab. And I'll actually just hit backspace a couple of times to get rid of that, or three times, I guess, to get rid of that until it takes me back here. Um, when I'm done with a multi-level list, I can't hit, uh, or I guess I can, that's new. Um, in most versions of Word, I can't hit enter to get me back to kind of regular listing. Um, I'll probably have to hit, I'll have to create a new blank item like this 
and I'll have to hit backspace three times, it looks like, in order to get back to, uh, back to a, a kind of normal text. OK, cool. So um, we've got our, uh, uh, so uh, that's listing. Oh, there are a couple other things up here to, um, to look at. You have the option to organize your paragraphs in, um, in alphabetical or numerical order. That's useful if you've got like a list. Um, let's say I wanted to organize this alphabetically. I'll select that, hit this A to Z button, paragraphs, text, ascending. If I just click OK, basically, and use the defaults, now I've got bacon first, and then cereal, and then eggs, and so on. Um, so that can be useful if you need to alphabetize or if you need to organize something uh, numerically. Another thing that you can do up here at the top in between those is uh, you can indent without using making a list or something. So if this paragraph should be indented, I can just come up here, click on this right indent or increase indent button, and that'll indent the whole paragraph for me right there. And uh, I can do it again if I want to go more and so on. So um, that's, and then there's de indent or decrease indent, take you back to the left, obviously. Uh, one last thing in this paragraph section before we move on to other stuff. Um, if I click on this button right here with this little symbol on it, um, that's the show and hide uh, formatting symbols button. What that does is it gives me all these little, little funny symbols uh, that, that show me the invisible things that are happening in my document. For example, this is a paragraph mark, and that's what stands in for all of these symbols. This little thing's a paragraph mark. Uh, if I see that, I know that Word considers that to be the end of this paragraph. Basically, I press enter at that point in the, uh, in the document. Again, this is the end of that one, this is the end of that one, and so on. Um, you'll notice in between individual words, you have a dot. Uh, so um, this dot is dot in dot standard dot style dot. It's different from a period. It's like a dot in the middle of the line. But those dots represent spaces. By the way, um, folks may have told you when you first started using a computer um, that you should separate uh, sentences from each other by uh, double spacing. You don't need to do that. Uh, you only need one space in between each sentence in, uh, in a digital document. Um, so you can, you can figure out whether you have spaces there. These little arrows right here indicate the indents um, that, are, uh, that my list automatically created for me. So that's useful sometimes if your document's doing something weird, you can turn those formatting marks on and you can see what's going on visually, pretty handy. Cool. And that's the paragraph section right here. Um, We've got a few other things that we can uh, that uh, we can talk about um, before we move on from all of that. I do want to just check: uh, Are there any questions about those sorts of things before we move on and kind of shift gears? Cool. I don't see anything so far, but um, if you had a question, you just haven't had a chance to type it out yet, then continue to type it and send it on to me and we'll uh, we'll tackle it. Okay, let's talk about a few useful other things here. Okay, um, first thing I wanna show you is uh, how to put a picture in. Now, Word is not really in, um, it's not really designed for handling images super duper well. Um, Oh, uh, someone asks, how do I indent the first line of a paragraph only? Uh, if you need to do that for whatever reason, um, that's called a hanging indent. Um, the Probably the easiest way to do that is uh, to come up here in the ruler. This little, this little thing right here we haven't really talked about. It's called the ruler. Basically, it just shows you the size of your, of your page. It also allows you to change uh, this um, some of this stuff. So you'll see there's two little kind of arrows here and then a little line down here. 
So um, what you'll want to do is, uh, or no, excuse me, that's not called the hanging indent. I apologize. Um, that's, uh, that's something slightly different. So uh, if you don't see the ruler for whatever reason, um, click on the view tab and find here the ruler checkbox and make sure that that's checked um, and you should see it. Up here at the top, this little, this little arrow that's pointing down at the top over here on the left, that is our first line indent. So if I click on that and I drag it inward a little bit, let's say, I don't know, half an inch, drop it here. Then what's gonna happen for this paragraph moving forward There we go, cool. So that's how that would work. And if you if you did that at the beginning of your document, then that setting would continue forward. Um, uh, like, so that paragraph would have it too. Good question, thank you. Okay, let's move on and talk about how to insert a picture. I'm gonna change this setting back just so that it doesn't throw me off. Okay. Um, so uh, to do that, you know what, to do that, I'm gonna start at the top of a new page. Um, most of the time, most of us will, if we wanna start at the top of a new page in a document, we'll do this, enter, 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 until we get to the top of the next page. However, that can be problematic because if I put something here, then when I make changes, up here on this, uh, in this page, for instance, deleting this paragraph that didn't work out, uh, then that moves back to the bottom of the previous page and we've got a bit of a problem there. So um, I don't want that. I wanna start at the top of a new page uh, and uh, the cleanest way to do that, instead of using, uh, instead of just pressing enter, enter, enter until I get to the bottom, is instead to insert what's called a page break. So I'm gonna go up here to the top and click on the insert tab, and then I'm gonna click on page break. When I do that, it moves me down uh, to the bottom. Now I'll turn on those formatting marks again for a moment, and you'll see there's actually a thing here that says page break. What that tells me is anything that's before this little dot, 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 dot page break, dot, 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 Anything that's before that is going to appear on page one, or if page one gets long enough, it'll overflow into page two. Um, but then uh, anything after this is going to appear at the top of a new page. So, um, so that uh, that allows me to see, like, oh, hey, there's a you know there's a, a break here. Um, handy sometimes. I'll go ahead and remove that for the moment. Let's. Uh, let's drop in a picture. So I'm gonna go to the insert tab again. I'll click insert, click on pictures and this device. And I'll go ahead and look for a picture of some sort. And I'll just find my little Microsoft Teams. Oh, that's not what I want. We'll grab a stock photo. There we go, cool. I'll click insert. Apparently it's thinking about it. There we go, okay, cool. So now I have this picture in my document. You'll notice uh, Word generates uh, what it calls alt text. So um, alt text is basically um, text that describes an image for somebody who can't see it. Um, so that's pretty handy. Um, you know, I might come down here and actually uh, click on that to edit it um, and say something like a picture of spices. So that way my, um, uh, that way my, uh, um, my text is, or 
my image is properly described for anybody who can't see it. Um, so I've got that squared away. Uh, in addition to that, I've got, let's see, let's move this a little bit. So I'm gonna move my mouse over it. Um, and you'll notice I get the mouse pointer and four arrows pointing up, down, left, and right. I'm gonna hold down with my mouse button. I'm gonna drag this up a little bit till I get to, let's say here, the beginning of this paragraph. When I do that, drops it in there, or maybe before that sentence. When I do that, okay, so we've got something weird happening here. Because Word is mostly a program for dealing with text, when you insert an image into your Word document, Word treats the image as basically just another word on the page. And so you'll notice I put this in the middle of the paragraph um, in between the sentence and come to think of it, there wasn't a cloud in the sky and the sentence, so not stormy at all, I suppose. Um, and in doing so, I broke up my paragraph. I made the justified text get real weird on the spacing and uh, it's just not great all around. So what I need to do is change the way that my text is positioned or that my, yeah, that my text is positioned relative to my image. What I'm gonna do is either come up here to the top, you'll notice I have this new picture format tab that appears whenever I'm working with a picture, when I have a picture selected. Um, but also there's this little button here next to this. Either one I can click on and I can change uh, and I can turn on text wrapping here. If I do this square, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna take text and it's gonna sort of flow it around my image, sort of a square way. If I slide this, if I make it a little smaller by dragging the corners, then you'll notice I get like this paragraph starts here and then the text kind of flows through. That's not a great, that's not very readable. So I could go, if I do tight, it's gonna like squish the text in a little closer perhaps around it. Uh, through, if there are any transparent areas of my image, it will actually put the text through them. One of the ones that I prefer is top and bottom. If I click on that, then wherever I put the text, it's just gonna, it's just gonna say, okay, at the end of the line, here's a picture. And then you go down to the next line. That one seems like a really useful one. There's also uh, behind text and in front of text. Behind text means that your text just literally goes right over the picture and kind of ignores it. And then uh, in front of text, of course, blocks your whatever text is behind the image from view, which is usually not ideal. Um, I can also choose fix position on page rather than move with text. If I do move with text, what's gonna happen is if I put more text here, it's gonna push the picture down. If I do fix position on page, then if I, then whatever text I have around this image is just gonna flow around it and the image is gonna stay put. So, um, so that's your text wrapping uh, for pictures. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna talk about pictures anymore basically because Word is again, mostly a text program, not necessarily so much a picture program, um, but it's useful to know how to insert a picture in, in your document sometimes. All right, so only a couple more things to go here. I'm actually gonna move this down so that I just get it out of the way for a moment. Okay. So the last, um, <clears throat> the last couple of things that I wanna talk about are on this layout tab over here or page layout tab uh, in some cases. Um, if I click on the layout tab, you'll notice I can change my margins, orientation and page size here. So the margins, by default, the normal margins, at least in, uh, in newer versions of Word, are one inch all the way around. So uh, you've got one inch of blank space uh, on every edge of the page. Narrow will reduce that down to half an inch. Um, you've got moderate, which is um, uh, two, or excuse me, three fourths of an inch on the left and right, and still an inch on the top and bottom. Uh, wide will give you very ridiculously wide margins. Um, there's mirrored, which sort of gives you two different sections of the page um, in a weird way. And then Office 2003 default. So back in, uh, back in the, in Microsoft Word 2003, uh, these would be the settings that, uh, that you would have when you first opened up a document. One inch margins at the top and bottom, and then uh, one and a quarter inch on the left and right. 
Um, so if I want to change my margins, I can do that here. Um, I can also, if I want to select custom margins down at the bottom and make it exactly the way I want it to be. Orientation, I can basically flip my page on its side. So rather than, um, rather than portrait, so kind of like taller than it is wide, I can go to landscape, so wider than it is tall. You'll notice, by the way, this text gets pushed down to, um, uh, to the next page. And my, um, my page break means that now there's a third page here. There we go, just so we can see that. Um, because there's less room for text when I turn the page on its side. There we go, cool, cool. All right, uh, size, I can change the size of the page so I can go to, um, I could go to say tabloid size page where it's 11 inches uh, wide and 17 inches tall um, or a ledger, which is 17 or which is the same size of page, but on its side, basically. Um, legal size page, so eight and a half wide, but 14 inches tall, like those yellow legal pads, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different uh, types of page sizes you can do there. Um, the other thing I want to show you, though, is columns. So let's say that I want to make this paragraph, let me get rid of those formatting marks, they're distracting right now. Um, let's say I want to change this paragraph to be um, to be in two columns. I'm going to select it. And I'm going to go to this columns button right here. When I click on that, it gives me the drop down menu. And instead of one column, I could switch it to two. So now I have a paragraph with two columns. Uh, I could change it to three if I want. Um, and you can look up here, by the way, and see the width of the individual columns. So this is a column, and then this gray is the, uh, the space between the columns. There's another column, and then the gray space between the columns again. Um, I can also do, I could do a left column where there's like a little column over here and a wider one on the right, and the opposite. I can also hit more columns and make specific changes. I can have a column that's exactly such and such width and another column that's exactly such and such other width um, or whatever the case may be. Uh, if I wanna say, for instance, if I want to end a column specifically with this with right here, which is typically not a terribly dark time of day, if I want that to be the end of a column, I can come back up here click on breaks on the, on the layout tab and click column. And that'll actually create what's called a column break. So that says, this is the end of a column, move to the next column. Um, and you can see that when I turn the formatting marks on. Uh, let's see. And so there are a bunch of other, we'll talk about sections on Thursday uh, in part two. Um, so, and we can talk about section breaks at that time. Um, and, uh, and a few other things like that. Using breaks in your document like that is really convenient for, just makes formatting your document and, and um, avoiding stuff that looks weird a lot easier. <laughs> but that's pretty much it uh, for part one here. Um, do y'all have any questions before we wrap it up for today? All right, excellent. Doesn't look like it. So we will, um, uh, you know, if you do have questions afterward, you can shoot me an email. Um, my, uh, uh, the email address to use is digital at cals.org. Uh, if you haven't already registered for part two on Thursday, um, then uh, you, uh, then uh, I certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, it's, there's nothing additional that you will need to know before you jump into part two. Uh, you've you've learned it now. Um, if you want to register, uh, I'll put a link in the chat, cals.org slash event slash word part two. 
Um, and I would definitely love to have you then as well. Okay, I did get a question. To create columns, should I always type the text first? No, not necessarily. Um, if you wanted to, let's say I want this page to be uh, in columns here. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and I'll delete this text. Okay, so starting here from after the page break, let's say I want this page to be in columns. I'll come up here, click on columns. I don't have to have anything selected or anything. I'll just hit two. And from and you'll notice um, it actually does it starting with the, well, starting with the section that I have there. So that's not ideal. I'm gonna hit undo on that. Um, I'll come back up here, columns and click more columns. And down here where it says, I'll select two columns, down here where it says apply to rather than this section, I'm gonna say this point forward and click that and then click okay. Now you'll notice, here on this page, on page three, if I started typing, like you can see on the ruler, it's got this, this gray area here. So it's going to put my text in two columns, starting from here, going onward. If I come back up here though, and I look at this page, this page is in a single column like I had it before. Um, and of course, if I want to, um, so, So I have, this is in column one right here. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and insert a column break. Oops, stay out. It should be on the insert tab, but it's not. So I'll put in a column break and then this is in column two, there we go. And then anything I put before this or before the, the column break um, will be in column one. Anything after the column break will be in column two. If I don't use a column break at all, which a lot of times you don't, um, then once column one is filled up, it'll just go, you'll just start at the top of column two. Good question. Um, by the way, if I'm doing something like this and I want it to be like two things that are side by side, normally I'll use a table for that rather than columns um, because uh, that makes it cleaner and you can actually add like lines so you can see and shading so you can see what's on each line um, and that makes it can make it a little more readable sometimes. Good question. Any other questions before we wrap it up? All right. Thank you all so much for coming and uh, joining me. And uh, hopefully I will see everybody on Thursday. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye now.